it's also not fair because we've been writing it like for 10 years now. So <laughs> <laughs> it's never going to finish. So um, I'm going to be talking ab about a lot of causal inference and more specifically about how do we learn what works. And because that is what I do, that's what um, the people that I work with do. So I'm going to present uh, a two-step two algorithm for causal inference that some of you may know already, uh, but it's, it's really important for the health sciences and for the social sciences. So the first question, of course, is why, why do we want to know what works? And the answer is obvious. Uh, we, we want to know what works because we have to make decisions. And those decisions have to be made now, so we do, do we, we do research for that. In medical research, we ask questions like, okay, which, uh, which treatment should we use for these patients? Should we do it A or B? Should we do it now or later? Should we uh, switch at some point to a more effective treatment or not? Should we treat everybody or just some people at a given time? Etc. For public health uh, policy, it's kind of the same. Uh, the questions have the same basic form. Is uh, should we do this public health for now, later, for everybody, for some people? Should we stop it, etc. So, essentially, any time that we want, we need to make decisions. We have to have um, data on the comparative effectiveness and safety of the different types of interventions that we are considering. And that is, that is what causal inference is, really, or a large part of causal inference is about that. It's about, about studying the comparative effectiveness and safety of different courses of action. Uh, can people hear me there? OK, great. So if you ask any scientist, how do we learn what works? There is a standard answer, which is, well, conduct a randomized experiment. And if you think about any questions about, does this co is, is this course of action better than this course of action for some outcome? There is always a way of answering that, in principle, by conducting a randomized experiment. If it is with humans, we call it a randomized trial. Um, the problem, of course, is that we cannot do that most of the time. Trials may be, may be very extensive, may not be ethical, uh, may not be feasible, or may not be timely. So even, even if we can conduct a randomized experiment, even if that's possible and we'll do it at some point, the problem is that that will take five years or 10 years from the moment we decide we are going to do it until we have our final results. And in those years, we need to make decisions. So even if we can do trials, we are not going to be able to have a trial to answer any, any public health, any policy question now. And that's why we analyze observational data. So when I say observational data, I talk I, I am referring to different types of data. There are, there are um, observational data that have, that have been collected specifically for research. For example, in, in, in health, there are epi, epidemiological studies that are conducted for research. For example, the nursing health is the nurses' health study is a study of about 120,000 women followed since 1976 by researchers at Harvard. And they are following these women for decades. They are, they are, they are asking them questions. They are getting blood from them and doing all types of tests every two years, etc. So that, that is not an experiment. That is observational data, but that has been collected for research. We also have a lot of observational data that we all work with, I'm sure, that had not been collected for research. And this is what some people refer to as real world data, is that it's a bad word now. Or, um, and in the, in, the, in the health field, this data comes from and from um, 
electronic health records, like medical records of, or claims. Uh, the, for example, we do a lot of work, and I'll talk a little bit about that using data from Medicare. So these are all different types of observational data. So they all have in common that we have not assigned the different treatments, the different exposures, the different uh, courses of actions, of action that we are interested in. We haven't assigned them at random. And in some cases, we didn't even have any say on how the data were collected and assembled. Okay, so the point, and this is a, this is this is a this is a very important point that I that I want to make, is that we analyze observational data because we cannot conduct a randomized experiment. If we could conduct a randomized experiment for the question that we are interested in, and we could do it now, we would do it, but we can't. So we can think of our observational analysis for causal inference as an attempt to emulate the randomized experiment that we would like to conduct, but we can't. So think of that. For any comparative effectiveness question that we have, any comparative safety question that we have, there is, in principle, there is in principle, a hypothetical experiment that would answer that question. But we cannot do it, or we cannot do it now. So we use observational data to emulate that Trial. That trial is our target of inference. That is why we refer to it as a target trial. So the target trial is the hypothetical randomized trial that we would like to conduct to answer a causal question. Because we cannot do it, we use the observational data to try to emulate that. So uh, one consequence of this way of thinking is that if we cannot think of a hypothetical randomized experiment that would answer our causal question, then our causal question may not be well defined. Then maybe we don't know what we are trying to answer. Okay, so uh, the target trial is a, is a very old concept in causal inference. People have been referring to this hypothetical experiment at least since the 1950s, uh, Dorn, uh, um, a statistician at NIH, was talking very explicitly about this hypothetical experiment, uh, although he, he didn't call it a target trial, but that was the same concept. Bill Cochran at Harvard in the 60s uh, was, was talking about the target trial. Again, not with a name, but, uh, the, but a very similar concept, Don Rubin, who was Cochrane's graduate student, uh, was doing that also in the 1970s. Al Feinstein at Yale, uh, who was a clinical epidemiologist, was also talking about that, and Phil David in England, etc. So the, many, many people in the field of causal inference have been thinking of the analysis of observational data as an attempt to emulate some trials. Uh, Jamie Robbins in the in the eighties also at Harvard made this concept more general because Jamie Robbins is the first person who has started talking about <clears throat> how to make causal inference when treatments vary over time. Not uh, not just asking questions about is it better to be treated or not, one or zero, but what happens with the treatment can be one zero zero one 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 zero zero two zero one which is uh, what most treatments are in the health science. And Jamie and I wrote a paper a couple of years ago that puts this, uh, that lays out this concept of a target trial in a more explicit way for both uh, time fit and time -bound. So if we think about the target trial, then we can think about this two-step two <coughs> algorithm for causal inference. And the first step, is this. The first step is we have to ask a causal question. Um, the second step is we have to answer the causal question. <laughs> and and this, this sounds like a joke, but it's really a very important point. This is really what causal inference is. First, we have to ask the question, then we have to answer the question. So to ask a causal question, we have to 
describe the target trap. That's a simple way of describing a cost of question. Tell me what your target trial is. Even if you cannot do it, but <coughs> tell me what the trial is. The second part, the second step to answer the question, we can either conduct the target trial, if that's possible, or emulate it using observational data. But before we start analyzing the observational data, we need to know what our target is. We need to know what is the question that we are trying to that we are trying to answer. So when I say that we have to describe the target trial, I mean that we really need to describe the protocol of the randomized experiment that we would like to conduct. We have to describe um, the the key components of the protocol of the trial, which is what are the eligibility criteria, what are the treatment strategies, how is how we are going to assign treatment, the start and end of follow-up, the outcomes, the cost of contrast, this is going to be an intention to treat effect or a protocol effect, and the statistical analysis plan. And once we, we know that, if I can tell you all these components of my hypothetical target trial, you know exactly the question, that I, the cost of question that I am asking. The next step is you observational data to mimic each of the components of the target trial. <clears throat> and this is what I'm going to be discussing here today. But, now, what, but why is this important? You say, okay, fine, uh, great. Uh, we have a target trial. So I'm, I'm going to give you an example of why it's important to, to go is step one and step two, as opposed to jumping into step two and analyzing data without knowing what the cause of question is. And this example that I'm going to give you is very well known in the medical world. It's, uh, it's the example of, of hormone therapy for postmenopausal women and, um, and risk of heart disease. Have people heard about this before? Some? Oh, yeah. So just a very brief intro to this, to this topic. In the 1980s and 1990s, there were many observational studies that tried to estimate the effect of postmenopausal hormone therapy on the risk of heart disease among women. And these studies, which were published in the best medical journals, um, they all found apparently a benefit of hormone therapy. They found hazard ratios or of about 0.7. Uh, some studies were 0.8, some studies were 0.5, even 0.4 in some of them, but they, they found, say, when, when you look at, at them, about a 30% lower risk of heart disease among women taking hormone therapy than women not taking hormone therapy. Okay? Uh, one of the largest of these studies was the nurses' health study that I just mentioned, and in their last update, they found around 0.72. Okay. Uh, then, in, the, in 2002, the results of a large randomized trial of hormone therapy were published, first in 2002 in JAMA and in 2003 in the New England Journal, and this study found exactly the opposite. So this large randomized trial found that women assigned to hormone therapy had a 24% increase in the risk of heart disease that women assigned to no hormone therapy. And this was shocking. <laughs> this was really shocking. When people saw this, it was like, um, they, wow, this is, this, is, this is really bad. Because, because see, people, had, people were convinced that hormone therapy were beneficial. And it all makes sense, right? Uh, women have a lower risk of heart disease than men. Why? Well, because women have estrogens and men don't. And after menopause, the risk of heart disease goes up in women. Why? Well, because now they have fewer estrogens. So if we give estrogens to women after menopause, it should have a beneficial effect on heart disease. This makes sense, but it wasn't true. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't as simple as people. So the, um, this trial, the, the large um, 
trial, uh, which was known as the Women's Health Initiative, this was a very, a very expensive undertaking. It was actually part of a set of three or four randomized trials plus an observational study that NIH funded. The total cost is not known, but it's probably in close to a billion dollars. It was a huge undertaking. And this particular trial of opposed estrogen therapy, um, they had 8,000 women in each arm. They were going to follow them for eight years, but they couldn't because of the harm, because the harm was very clear, not only for heart disease, but also for breast cancer and other things. So they had to stop the trial after 5.5 years. Also, <clears throat> so women were randomly assigned to either opposed estrogen or no estrogen. So let me, let me show you what the results from the trial um, were, because these are important here. The hazard ratio was 1.24 or 1.23. It depends how you do the analysis. Uh, so 24% increase in the risk. The um, lower limit of the 95% confidence interval was 0.99 or 1.01. It depends how you do the analysis. I'm sure with this very sophisticated audience, I don't have to explain that it doesn't matter whether the confidence interval includes one or not, uh, right? This is like you go to buy a new shirt and you have one shirt for $99.99 and, and another shirt for $100.01. You don't make a decision based on that difference, right? <laughs> you know, this is much cheaper than this one. Okay, right? So the same in science. We don't make decisions about what works or not based on, on an arbitrary but anyway, in the first two years of follow-up, the hazard ratio was 1.5, so 50% increase in the risk of heart disease in the first two years of follow-up. And after that, the hazard ratio went down. So if we exclude the first two years of follow-up from our analysis and we look only at years uh, three to five, the hazard ratio was 1.3. If we exclude the first five years of follow-up and we look only at the women that are left after five years, the hazard ratio is 0.7. So can people think of a reason why the hazard ratio goes down? Well, there is one, there is one um, good candidate for that, which is that after five years, we've managed to kill all the susceptible women in the hormone therapy group, right? So after five years, the hormone therapy group has been depleted of women that were most susceptible to hormone therapy. And the women that are left there are these super women that doesn't matter what we throw at them, they don't develop heart disease, right? Now, after five years, if we compare women left, these super women in the in the hormone therapy group with the normal women in the placebo group, yeah, of course, super women have a lower risk of heart disease than the normal women. That's not, that doesn't have any causal in the predation, it's just uh, a result of the bias that we have excluded the susceptible women in the okay. So this actually, um, my colleague, Matt, Matt is Stenfield and others have looked at this from a mathematical point of view, and they show that this, based on this depletion of susceptibles, the hazard ratio can go down from actually 1.8 in the first year only to 0.7 after five years, even if hormone therapy is not beneficial for a, a single woman in the study. So this is just a, a function of the bias of the... Um, depletion of susceptible. Okay, so now we will come back to that. If you ask people now, why did observational studies get it wrong? Why did observational studies found an apparent benefit of hormone therapy when the trial found no benefit? A lot of people will tell you some version of, well, observational studies got it wrong because they are observational. And we are not randomly assigning treatment, and they may be confounding. Women who take hormone therapy are different from women who don't. 
especially in the U.S. in the 1980s and 90s, women who are, uh, have access to hormone therapy, they probably also have access to many other uh, as aspects of healthcare that are um, good for the, um, that lower the risk of heart disease, right? And also they are wealthier and they have, they are more physically active, etc. So that is, that is possible, of course, with any observation and study. But we had an alternative theory, which was that the observational studies were not emulating a target trial. They, they were not doing a, a step one of our causal inference algorithm. Because think about this. Think about what the trial did. The trial compared women who were assigned and initiated hormone therapy with women who were not initiating hormone therapy at base. Okay? The trial was comparing initiators of therapy versus non-initiators of therapy, new users of therapy, incident users of therapy versus non-users. But that's not what the observational studies were doing. The observational studies were comparing women who happened to be using hormone therapy with women who were not using hormone therapy. Now, women who were using hormone therapy were women who have been using for some time, for one year, for five years, so they were the least susceptible. They have been using hormone therapy for some time, and they have not developed heart disease, because if they had, they were not included. So the observational studies were not comparing incident users versus non-users. They were comparing prevalent users, current users, versus non-users. And they found a hazard ratio of 0.7, which is exactly what you find in the trial if you do an analysis in which you exclude the first five years of follow-up. Of course, you will never do that in the trial, because it's wrong. But that's what the observational studies were doing. They were comparing current users versus never users, and why? Why would you do an analysis in the trial, in the observational studies, that you will never do in a randomized trial? Because the observational data was being analyzed without thinking of the cost of because of thinking of what the target trial was. They would have never done it if they had thought of, oh, I'm trying to emulate this target trial. Because in no target trial, you have women at baseline who have already been using the treatment of interest for a few years. So in a sense, there was no discrepancy at all between the randomized trial and the observational studies if you compare prevalent users. The question is, of course, that that's not what we want to Compare. So, so um, I mean, just to make this, this point very clear and to link to the decision making that I was referring to at the start, the trial was asking, was giving an answer to a question. It was guiding a decision whether to start or not. The observation size were not. Because imagine that I am a postmenopausal woman, I go to my doctor and I ask her, Look, I am considering initiating hormone therapy, but I'm concerned about the risk of heart disease. What do you tell me? Imagine that my doctor tells me, well, um, if you start hormone therapy now, and you happen to survive five years, <laughs> you do very well, because then we know that you are a super woman that has a very, raw, a very low risk of heart disease. That is, that is really what the observational studies were doing. Were doing. So it, the, the, the estimates that they were given were not conducive to helping decision-making. OK, so what we did was to use the observational data to emulate a target trial. So we did first, we defined the target trial, which in fact is very similar to the women's health initiative trial that had been conducted already, and then we emulated using data from the nursing health study. So we, we did all, all of these things. Um, the first thing that we had to do, and we'll have to read that, but this is the outline of the target trial. We are saying what the eligibility criteria are for our target trial, what two treatment strategies we are going to compare, um, what, how we are going to assign people to the treatment strategies, the start and end of follow up, the outcome, etc. So that's the first thing, just an outline of the target trial. Now, 
we use observational data to emulate it. Notice that when we use observational data, we are never going to be able to emulate, for example, a trial with a placebo control, because that doesn't exist in the data. We are never, so we will compare versus treatment versus no treatment or some standard of care. Um, but that's fine. That's fine when the goal is to help make a decision for treatment versus no treatment or versus a standard of care. Also, we are not going to be able to emulate a trial with, with, a, with a blind sign in which patients don't know what they are taking and doctors don't know what they are giving because, of course, that is not possible. We don't have that in the observational data. So there are some constraints about the type of trials that we can emulate using observational data. And this also, I hope that it clears some confusions when people try to compare certain type of randomized trials, placebo control, double blind, etc., with observational studies. Those are not comparable. They, they are different causal questions. OK, so um, um, we were working with our colleagues from the nursing health study. And we used the data from this study. About 80,000 women followed since 1980 when, when they have all their, in, all their information on lifestyle and all the compounds that we wanted to adjust for diet. To. And every two years in this study, women receive a questionnaire. Um, and they self-report whether they have had heart disease or not, etc. Then the investigators go to the, um, they write to the, to the treating physician for those women and they check whether they have heart disease or not, etc. They also ask questions about treatments, about uh, diet, about cigarette <coughs> smoking or physical activity, etc. So we use this data to emulate the eligibility criteria of the trial, the treatment strategies of the trial, initiation of common therapy versus no initiation of common therapy, the outcome of the trial, um, a difference between observational studies and trials in, is that in many trials you can ascertain the outcome in a blind way so that, that the person who decides whether the participant had heart disease or not doesn't know which treatment the participant was assigned to and that's a good thing we want to that. We are never going to be able to do that with observational data, and that's also a difference that we need to keep in mind. Uh, that, that cannot be done, except for death, when it doesn't matter. Uh, the person knows whether they, you know whether the person is, that, is dead or not, and it doesn't matter which treatment they, they got. But for all the outcome, it's possible that the treatment that they were getting somehow has an effect on the ascertainment of the outcome. Okay. The randomized ad assignment. In the target trial, treatment is randomly assigned. In the observational study, it's not. And of course, this is the main difference between a true randomized trial and the observational study. How do we emulate randomized assignment in an observational study? Well, this is what adjustment for compounding does. When we say we are adjusting for compounding, what we mean is we are trying to emulate the randomized assignment of the target trial. If we somehow were able to adjust for all the confounders, then there will be no difference between a randomized trial and an observational study. Of course, this is a big weakness of any observational analysis and one of the reasons why we prefer a randomized trial. The fact that we never know where we have adjusted for all the confounders. So here we did the best that we could. We, uh, we chose a lot of confounders listed there. Uh, everything that we could find in the data that was a risk factor for heart disease and adjusted for that. If we, are, if we are missing any important variables, our results will be biased. And most importantly, we will know it. That is, that is a problem with observational data from, um, from causal inference from observation. So what we did then is we compared the, the incidence of coronary heart disease in women in the hormone therapy initiation group and women in the no initiation group after adjustment for all of these variables. And we adjusted for these variables using different methods. The method 
whether we put all these errors in a cost model or we use propensity scores or we use uh, structural nesting models, it doesn't matter. It, it doesn't matter, really. What matters is that we adjust it for, for those errors. How we did it? Well, all, all these methods uh, work very, very well for, for time-fixed confounders, which is what we have here. So it doesn't really matter. It's a matter of taste. That some people may like use propensity to score matching, and other people may like to put the variables in the box model. You choose what you want. They all, they all work here. So um, after doing this, we found a half a ratio of 1.05. So not 0.7, but 1.05. In the first two years of follow-up, the trial had a half a ratio of 1.5. We found a half a ratio of 1.4. You can see that the confidence intervals are wide, both from the, for the trial and for the observational study. In fact, they, they are equally wide. Um, but you also see that by looking at these results, there are no shocking discrepancies between the observational study and the randomized trial. And see, we haven't changed much. We have changed the question. Rather than comparing prevalent users and never users, we are comparing incident users and never users with the same data, with the same amount of confounding, with the same quality of collection of everything. We have just changed the question, and everything else follows from that. So um, this doesn't mean that there is no confounding. There may be some residual confounding that we haven't been able to adjust for, but it clearly wasn't the most important part of this discrepancy. What really matters is that the observational study were not even trying to emulate a target trial. So they have this. this. Okay. Now, here we were, we were playing with a little <coughs> bit of. Um, it wasn't fair in the sense that the nursing health study is, is, uh, is a very high quality study where we have data on every single woman every two years. Uh, there that, that, that is a whole team of people. Uh, that works on making sure that these that this data are good, are complete. So what happens if we try to do this with real world data, with a, with a database um, of, say, claims data? And that is, that is what I'm going to show you now, a few examples um, using different databases. So, okay, so this is... Um, this is a good example because it uses um, Medicare data, which is very, which is uh, essentially publicly available for research if you pay for. You may know what what this treatment the, is statins are. This is a treatment that many people take, and it lowers LDL in blood, so that in turn uh, has effects on. Well, I have to see too. Now, some people have been conducting observational studies to estimate the effect of studies on the mortality of individuals with cancer. And they found that if you give studies that um, individuals with cancer who, have, is, who, who use studies have a 30% lower mortality than those who don't, which is surprising. Because if that's true, that means that Isadins is one of the best cancer treatments that we have. <laughs> so these studies, again, were observational analysis of data in which a target trial had not been explicitly um, specified. So we did that. Uh, so again, step one, we find the eligibility criteria, the two treatment groups, um, initiation of studies after cancer diagnosis versus no initiation, um, the assignment, the follow-up period, the outcome, etc. And we did that with um, with this database that is known as CIR Medicare. CIR is a, is a database of cancer registries in 12 states. And Medicare is, as you all know, is the federal um, insurance program for people 65 years older. So there is a linkage of SEER and 
Medicare so that for all cancer patients in these 12 states, we have all their Medicare claims after that. And that includes data on use of statins and death and many, many other things. So we use this data to emulate a target trial that I uh, described, and I'm jumping to the results. There's a lot of work between the last slide and this one. That I'm <laughs> and we found that the cumulative incidence of mortality in the statins and non-statins group were essentially the same. When you look at total mortality or cancer-specific mortality, really no difference at all, which is in contrast with what previous observational studies have found. So we were looking at previous observational studies and see how, how did they do it? And it turns out that they, uh, many of these studies, what they did were not, again, they didn't compare initiators of studying the system. Initiators, they compared current users, current users. So same story as with the nursing health study. And in those studies, they found hazard ratios of 0.8 or so, so 20% lower risk of mortality in cancer patients, which is exactly what we find we we left with our data. But again, that's not emulating a target trial, that's not answering a causal question that doesn't help decision making. Others, <coughs> other observational studies were even um, more concerning because what they did was to define anyone who is <coughs> starting doing the follow-up was included in the starting group. Now think of that. If if anyone who uses statins during the follow-up is included in the starting group, someone who started statins four years after the diagnosis of cancer and is included in the starting arm, well, that person has survived for four years already. Right? This is this is a bias known as immortal time bias, in which we assign people to the treatment group after they have survived some time, and we count all that time that they have survived in the treatment group, but they cannot die during, 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 during that time. So those designs found hazard ratios of 0.4. Huge effect, which is also kind of what we find when, when we're using that. So again, the problem here is that these studies are not emulating a target trial, because in a true trial, you assign people to the, to the treatment group at baseline. You don't wait three years or four years, and then you decide which group they are in, right? So that's, again, it's the same problem. Step one is not being done. People are jumping into step two. So if you think about these problems, the, the issue is that time zero of the randomized trial is not correctly emulated in the observational analysis. That's all about time zero. And see, when we think about observational analysis, we're very concerned about confounding. It turns out, I'm sh I show you a couple of examples where the problem is not confounding. The problem is the emulation of time zero, which is a very important problem in practice that we usually don't think of because we are fixated on confounding. So by Obsessing about compounding, we don't think about all the things that we can easily fix, like having time zero and the assignment of treatment at time zero done in the right way. And unlike compounding, which is a very serious problem and we never know whether we are adjusting for the compounders or not, the emulation of time zero can always be done correctly. So that is, I argue, that's the low hanging fruit for the improvement of observational analysis. Confounding will always be a problem. We never know if we can emulate the randomized assignment well, but we can emulate time zero. And um, see, so you think about time zero in the target trial, okay? In the actual, in the, if we could conduct a trial, time zero is very well defined. Time zero is the time where three things happen. It's the time when uh, people meet the eligibility criteria, when we assign them to treatment strategies, and when we start counting deaths or how disease or any outcomes that we, are, that, uh, that we have for interest. So time zero is where those three things happen, and they happen at the same time, at time zero. 
in observational studies, we should do the same thing. If we are conducting an observational analysis and we want it to be the, the trial, time zero has to be the time where those three things happen. And these examples that I, I was giving you, these are examples in which there is some, uh, in which these three things are not synchronous. For example, in the hormone therapy example, eligibility was a time zero, same time when we started counting who developed heart disease, that people have been using treatment before time zero. They were not at the same time. In the immortal time bias, immortal time bias example, that I gave you, eligibility was a time zero, but we were assigning people to one treatment group or the other after time. <coughs> Okay, so um, so why is it hard to ask to, why is this a problem that time zero is not correctly assigned in main observational analysis? Well, there are two main problems. One is that um, in many observational analysis, people are eligible for a target trial at multiple times. And then which one is time zero? We have to choose one of those times only, but which one? So that, that, is, that is one problem. I'll talk about that. And the second problem that I'm not going to discuss here in the interest of time is that sometimes we don't know the treatment group at time zero because we don't know what people are going to be doing in the future, and we have to do some special things for that too. So let's, let's talk about the problem that eligibility may not be defined at a single time. Um, and this is what... This didn't happen in the statins example that I gave you because here time zero the, uh, was the time of a first diagnosis of cancer. And for any of us, there's only one time in our lifetime where that is going to happen. So time zero could only be that time. But in the case of hormone therapy, for example, all the eligibility criteria could be met by a woman at age 55, or 56, or 57, or 58, or 59, as, so the same woman could meet the eligibility criteria at multiple times. Which of those times we choose at time zero? See, when we are doing a, a, a true trial, we only encounter people at a single time. Either they meet the criteria or they not. But when we have observational data over time, then we observe those people at multiple times and they can meet the criteria at multiple times. So how can we handle that? I'm going to give you an example based on colonoscopy. Uh, this is an example of colon colonoscopy and cancer. So a uh, very brief summary here. As you know, everyone at age 50 in the US is recommended to have a screening colonoscopy for colorectal cancer. That has never been proven. The, the effectiveness of that has never been proven in randomized trials. There are no trials of that because you will need trials with 100,000 people for, for 15 years. And there are no trials of that. Uh, actually, right now, as we speak, there are three ongoing trials looking at that, two in Europe, one in the US. Uh, but we made the decision to start um, this type of screening without data on trials. And even when these trials are finished in 10 years or so, the problem is going to be that um, these trials are only for younger people. Um, between age 50 and 60 something. But we have this recommendation of colonoscopy at age 50 and then every 10 years. So 60, age 60, age 70, age 80, age 90, when do we stop? Is, is it is something that we should still be doing at very old age or not? There are not going to be any trials for that. So we decided to emulate a trial of um, screening colonoscopy in people age 70 and old. Again, the first, the first step, we have to define what the trial is. The second step is we emulate it using data. In this case, we did it using Medicare data. 
Um, and the problem here is that the eligibility criteria for this trial may be met by the same person at different times. Mm -hmm. So if we are, we are including people between the ages of 70 and 74 at baseline, well, someone at 70 may meet the criteria, and, we, and one year later, that person is still meeting the criteria. And one year later, it's still meeting them. So what is time zero for that person? So one possibility is to choose a single time zero. Just choose it at random. Choose one, and that's it. Another possibility is to include in the an analysis all possible time zero, all possible time zero, time zero that that person has. And um, for example, if we, are, if we were using a single time zero, then we would put in the chronoscopy group individuals who meet the eligibility criteria at that time zero <coughs> and receive a chronoscopy. And in the no chronoscopy group, individuals who meet the eligibility criteria and did not receive a chronoscopy at that time. Um, we are using all eligible time zero. We will do it differently. We emulate a new target trial every week, say, or every month, or every day. And in each of those trials, we will check who meets the LGBT criteria and who doesn't. And let me show you how this, this is done. We, we start with an individual age 70. So this is the week of, of her 70th birthday. If the person meets the eligibility criteria, we put them in the target trial that starts that week and assign them to either screening or no screening. Now, among those who were not screened, we go to the next week. And if the person still meets the eligibility criteria that week, we put that person in the target trial that we are emulating for that week and put that person in either the screening group or the no screening group. And we keep doing that. So after doing this, we are emulating 260 trials. So each trial has the baseline at a different week. They all have a follow-up of 10 years. But we are starting the baseline at different, at different weeks. So using these multiple trials allows us to use all the data that we have. This is a more efficient way of doing it. Um, it is not necessary. We could choose just one time, but it's more efficient. And it also allows us to design this, uh, the observational analysis in the same way that we would observe, we, we would present the analysis from a true trial using a construct diagram. <coughs> this, is, this, is, this, is what, this is what we found doing this study. We found that in the colonoscopy trial, in the colonoscopy arm, there is a, a very sharp increase in colon cancer at baseline. So people go from 0% of colon cancer to almost 1%. That's precisely what the colonoscopy does. There, there is 1% of people with colon cancer, but they don't know it. So we find it there at baseline. The other thing that the colonoscopy does is that not only you find people with cancer, which is good because now you can uh, give them some treatment um, at an earlier stage in cancer, but you also find people with pre-cancer lesions. And during the colonoscopy, those pre-cancer lesions, those, those polyps and, uh, are excised, which means that those people are not going to develop cancer in the future. So it's not screening only, it's screening and primary <coughs> prevention of cancer at the same time. Which means that over time, people are going to still have cancer, but at a very low rate. Whereas in the no colonoscopy group, the cumulative incidence of cancer keeps going up. See, after around 4.5 years, the two curves cross. And it's become clear that it's better to have colonoscopy than not in terms of the incidence of cancer. This is, this is what we get when we use all time points all eligible time zeros. This is what we get when we use only one time zero. So it's the same qualitative story, but um, this is more precise. 
but we can always choose to use all time zeros or one time zero, but we're going to have narrower confidence intervals by doing that. Even after adjusting for the fact that some people are participating in more than one trial. Of course. Okay, so this all works. I'm going to show you now how analysis that have been conducted that didn't respect this basic principle of design, of causal inference design, didn't get the right answer. So let's say that we, let's say that you read a paper that says we are analyzing this data and we're putting in the colonoscopy group, well, the same people that we put in the colonoscopy group, but now we're going to put in the non colonoscopy group individuals who meet the eligibility criteria and did not receive a colonoscopy doing the follow-up. So as soon as you read this in a paper, you should be, there, there's this red light now going on. Oh, they are, they are looking at the future to decide who is in, in that group. They are looking at the future after time zero. That's never a good thing. In fact, in this case, it gives you a completely nonsensical result because if you don't include people who have a colonoscopy doing the follow-up, you are excluding everyone who had essentially colon cancer that was diagnosed through a colonoscopy. Another way of doing this, um, so this is biased. Another way of doing this is, let's say that you see, you read a paper that says, we are going to put in the colonoscopy group Everyone who met the eligibility criteria and received a colonoscopy in the five years before baseline, <coughs> and in the non colonoscopy group, everyone who met the eligibility criteria at baseline and did not receive a colonoscopy in the five years before baseline. This paper was published in a journal, in a good medical journal. Any time that you see this, again, a red light should be going on in your head because now they are defining the Eligibility criteria are sometimes zero, but they are using treatment that happened before time zero. We are going back to the hormone therapy example. This happens over and over and over in the medical literature. If you do this, you find this. You are getting rid of the early increase in colon cancer, of course, because you are looking at people who have had it in five years before and didn't have colon cancer. And when you look at this, you are going to find that the screening colonoscopy is great. It's fantastic. It's much better than it actually is. Why do people don't see this? And now we get into a second problem of observational analysis for cosmetics. They don't see this problem because they don't show these curves. Everything they show is a hazard ratio or some form of relative risk. And then you miss this bias. It is so obvious when you look at the absolute risk. So that's, that's the other thing that happens in observational analysis that almost never happens in randomized trials. In trials, you can, you can give the hazard ratio, but you always show the absolute risk. And in observational analysis, these curves are not shown many times. Why? Because we're not taught how to adjust the curves for the controllers. Therefore, we don't want to show the curves because they are not adjusted. But again, that can be done easily using inverse body weighting or, or many other methods. So um, the, the point here is that we can always choose a time zero that is correct. And only by doing that, we're going to improve the quality of observational analysis a lot. We may still have the problem of confounding, and there are many ways of dealing with that, none of them perfect. But uh, just by focusing on compounding only, we, we may miss the easiest way in which we can improve our observational analysis, which is the correct specification of time zero. OK, so um, let me uh, jump to, um, to the end here. Um, so there, there are, there are there's some, uh, there's some <coughs> good things that happen when we think in terms of the target trial. One is that we're essentially using counterfactual theory. So everything that I said here was about potential outcomes and counterfactual contrasts, et cetera, et cetera. I never had to mention that. I was just talking in terms of the target trial. That is logically the same as thinking in terms of counterfactuals. Also, by thinking in terms of the target trial, we eliminate some biases in a natural way 
we don't have biases due to immortal time bias, due to depletion of susceptibles, et cetera, that are very prevalent in observational research. We also, we also allow for a um, systematic evaluation of observational analysis, because we can think of each of the components of the target trial and which of them we are emulating better or worse. And in fact, this is, this is what the Cochrane Risk of Bias tool does, does now. They, they ask you to define your target trial, and then uh, based on, on how far the observational analysis is from the target trial, you can say what well, is a high risk or low risk is that. And I cannot finish without saying this, because this is very important. When I, when I talk about this, some people interpret what I'm saying as somehow saying, so that doesn't mean that we don't need randomized trials, because we can emulate them with observational studies. And that's not what I'm saying. This is, this is a true response that we get from a medical journal say, that said to our paper, this is a cohort study that tries to turn itself into a clinical trial. This involves a series of assumptions and maneuvers which lack credibility. See, that's, that's not the point. The point is not that we're going to convert observational studies into randomized trials. The point is that we can do better. Um, since we are going to keep using observational data, and other people are going to keep using observational data to make decisions, then by thinking in terms of the target trial, we'll make those observational studies better. And I'm giving you examples in which we know the right answer. And we can see that by, by, by thinking in terms of the target trial, we get closer to the right answer. So we expect that this is going to happen even when we don't know the right answer that if we do this, we are not hurting our research, we are making it better in, in the worst case, okay? So um, we emulate target trials because we cannot conduct the uh, actual time. And this is, why, this is why it's very important to think in, in terms of first asking the question, then answering the question. Uh, we cannot jump into very sophisticated methods to analyze the data that some of us make a living of, like inverse, inverse, inverse probability weighting or G estimation or the G formula, all these things that we teach, they're great, but only if we have a question, if we know what is the protocol of a target trial. Otherwise, it's just a waste of time to think of all, all these things. So, and this, this, is a, this is a commentary that I wrote earlier this year about this is so how a big part of the problem here is that in our journal, in, in scientific journals, many of them will not accept us talking about causal effects. They want us to write our papers in terms of associations only. And the problem of writing a paper in terms of associations and never mentioning the causal effect, the C word, is that we cannot explain what our goal is. We cannot explain what our target is. And if we cannot explain what our causal target is, then how can we justify our analysis to reach that target? So thinking in terms of a target trial is a way of still being explicitly causal without angering the editors of the journals. Don't want us to say that we're trying to estimate a causal effect. They say, fine, we're trying to emulate a trial and see if that works. Okay, so anytime that someone presents a causal analysis, um, the first question that we have to ask is, what is a target trial? And if, if they don't know what the target trial is, we can try to help them. And if we conclude that there is no possible target trial we can think of, even hypothetically, then chances are that's not a very good causal question. Okay, thank you. So um, I invite anyone to come up afterwards and ask a question and thank our guests for a wonderful talk. My name is Yushin. Hi. I'm a friend of this uh, Susan Murphy Foundation. But there is a woman. I, I like the presentation and the final one critique I have.